to allow them, Lord, to, to get in under the preaching and teaching of your word. Bless each one that's here. would ask, Lord, if anyone's here tonight that is not sure of heaven, that they've never trusted in the Lord, never repented of their sin, I pray that you would cause me to say that which the Holy Spirit can use to bring them to the saving knowledge of the truth. Bless our time together. We thank you for the opportunity to come and worship you. Just make it special for your honor and glory. We'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. There is a uh, an increased concern with, you know, purity. Uh, we want to drink pure water. We want to uh, breathe clean and pure air. Certainly, we want to eat clean and pure food. But I think. Uh, <clears throat> The problem is, is the, the world does not have the, uh, the understanding or see the necessity, really, of being pure in heart, which is really the most important of all of these. But, you know, purity, pure water, I, I looked online and it said that the United Nations, and this was a study done last year, it said the United Nations estimated that it would, be, it would cost $30 billion per year to provide clean water for the entire world. And uh, it said that sounds like a lot of money, $30 billion, just for everybody to have clean, clean water, pure water to drink. But it says that sounds like a lot, but not until you consider. Now, this is, this is year 2016, actually, that uh, the data is taken from. In 2016, $90 billion dollars was used or spent on bottled water alone. Can you imagine? Ninety billion dollars in 2016 for bottled water alone. I know in the States, <clears throat> even there in the States, a lot of people, they don't drink water out of the faucet. Uh, <clears throat> they go, you know, to the, to the grocery store and they, they buy all, all bottled water. I can't even imagine. Back in 2016, <clears throat> I'm, I'm sure it's well over a hundred billion dollars now per year just to have clean water. And so as, as important as it is to have clean air and clean water and clean food, uh, really the world falls short as far as the most important need for purity, and that's in our hearts and in our lives. Happy are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Joy is a heart condition. I would ask you tonight, you may have a smile on your face, but are you happy inside? Do you have joy inside? Do you have the joy of your salvation in your life this evening. What goes on the inside certainly is going to come to the surface sooner or later. We said that before, when you're under stress, when you're under pressure, and you're facing, you know, some terrible times beyond your ability, uh, I don't know, normally people are not nice to be around when they're under stress. Can you say amen? You know, you know what I'm saying? When people are stressed out, that's when you see the real individual. We can all be nice when things are going good. And we're all smiling and things are great, and things are fine. But when the bottom drops out and things are going, you know, crazy and they're out of, our, out of our ability to control them or to bring them back to where they need to be, really the real you and the real me comes to the surface. And it's usually not a pretty picture. And all God's people said, amen. amen. It's true. And so it's really what's on the inside is really what God sees you and I are pretty good at portraying a nice outside. I mean, we point our fingers to the Pharisees and we say, oh, the Pharisees, the Pharisees, the Pharisees, they were such hypocrites. The Lord constantly called them hypocrites. But I wonder how many of us would fit into that category of making the outside nice and clean and Christ-like and religious, but the inside really is not what it should be. I think all of us need to take heed and say, Lord, help me. Help me not to be a hypocrite. Help me not to be a Pharisee. Lord, help me to be more concerned with the internal than the external. See, if the internal's right, guess what? The external's going to be right. If the internal is not right, we can make the external appear to be clean, appear to be pure, appear to be right. But the truth of the matter is, who are we fooling? We can fool a lot of people. You can fool me. I can fool you. None of us can fool the Lord. We'll see that in our study this evening. To be pure in heart means to have 
unmixed motives, a person of integrity, unmixed motives. The Lord is concerned with why we do things as much as He is concerned of what we are doing. Most time we're concerned about what, what, what is the person doing. The Lord is also just as concerned with our motives as He is our actions. And so He has the ability to look in the heart. Take heed that you do not do your alms before men. This is over in Matthew 6, just a, just a chapter over. Take heed that you do not do your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward of your Father, which is in heaven. So when you and I do things just to be seen of men, what happens? We lose our, we lose our eternal reward or our heavenly reward or, or rewards that could be waiting for us when we do get to heaven. Uh, if you're doing it to be seen of men, if you're doing it to be applauded by men, then that's your reward. It's finished. It's, it's done. You're not deceiving anyone, certainly not deceiving the Lord. Jesus is saying joy comes when you are clean on the inside as you are on the outside. Of course, if you're dirty on the outside, chances are you're pretty dirty on the inside, for sure. And so we need to be clean on the inside. Three steps to have a pure heart. Number one, remember that God sees everything. Can you say amen? God sees everything. God doesn't miss a trick. God sees everything. Over in Matthew 6, 4, again, over, just over a chapter, uh, the Father which seeth in secret, the Father which seeth in secret. I think of uh, when we were in, well, you can go to Carlsbad Cameron's, it's the same way, but when we were over there uh, at Corregidor and we went into the, the caves at night and uh, the tunnel at night, and the, the, our guide said, <clears throat> he got us way back in, in the tunnel, and, and he says, turn off your lights. And we had flashlights, and so we turned off the lights. There was no other lights on in there. And the darkness was so thick. I mean, there was no ray of light anywhere. You're inside this cave, and, and there's no lights on. You can, you can wave your hand, and you can feel the air from your hand waving next to your face. You cannot see your hand. You can't see anything. It's pitch black. It's outer darkness. And yet, you know, you can do something in that outer darkness, and the Lord knows what you're doing. Amen? This, Psalm 139, we look at it every year. And Psalm 139 says, the darkness is as the day, or as the light to the Lord. Uh, certainly there's no hiding from him. Nothing is hidden from the Lord. He knows everything about us. And I think there's a lot of people that think, well, nobody saw me. I got away with it. And they fail to realize they didn't get away. You and I don't get away with anything. No one else gets away with anything. God sees it all. We're going to go to one, Psalm 139, verse 4. It's on the overhead. For there is not a word in my tongue but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it all together. What is that saying? Well, to me it's saying that there's not a, a word, even before we speak the word, even before we say the word, even before it comes out of our mouth, uh, there is not a word in my tongue. To me that means it hasn't really been spoken yet. I'm ready to speak it. I'm ready to say it. I haven't really said anything yet. And yet God knows not only what I'm going to say, but he knows my motive for what I'm going to say. That's what, that's what I believe the verse is saying. The Lord knows it all together. So he knows what we're going to say. He knows why we're going to say it. Uh, and so, you know, there's no, there's no deceiving the Lord. There's no fooling the Lord. Certainly there's no hiding anything from the Lord. If God already knows everything, and it shouldn't be if God already knows everything, since God already knows everything, then we should have some wisdom realizing, why should I, why should I be different on the inside than I am from the outside? Why should there be any variation? And the, the, the answer to that would be is because we do, the Bible says not to think more highly of yourself than you ought to think, but I think you would agree with me, we do want others to think more highly of us than they ought to think. Do you understand what I'm saying there? We want people to think highly of it, we, we, highly of us. We want people to like us. We want people to accept us. 
And so many times we go out of our way being something we're really not in order to please them that they will receive us and they will like us. And so there's the, the motive, I think, for being different on the inside and different on the outside. But what we fail to realize, the most important issue is, who are we trying to please? And we're going to see that tonight as well. Who are you trying to please? Who are you trying to fool? And it's easy to fool each other. It's easy to fool maybe mom or dad or brother or sister, husband or wife, but we'll never, ever fool the Lord. So remember that God sees everything. That should be a motivation to us, a motivation for us. Well, God's going to see it, and he's the one that really counts, okay? So I should have a pure heart. Number two, another step of having a pure heart is I need to review my motives. I need to review why do I do what I do? And again, the Bible says we, need, we can deceive ourselves. And I really believe we, we not only have the ability to do that, but many times we do, in fact, uh, deceive ourselves. I need to honestly evaluate why I do what I do. We're going to see uh, the examples, really, that we find here in the Word of God. Uh, if you have your Bible, you can turn over, just turning over a page, over to Matthew chapter 6. And we're going to see... In Matthew 6, actually three good things. Now, these are good things that we should be doing. Three good things that you can do, but you can do them in the wrong way. Three good things that we should be doing, but three good things that we can do in the wrong way with the wrong motive, okay? The first one is giving. And this is found in uh, Matthew 6, verse number 2. Matthew 6, verse number 2. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound the trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, <clears throat> that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have what? They have their reward. What's their reward? Well, they go and they blow the trumpet, and they want everybody to know how much they're giving. They want to make it public. Look, look at how much so-and-so is giving. Uh, we've seen that, you know, and uh, some individuals will give a, a big amount to a church. And actually, they'll, they'll have a big, we've said this before, they'll have the, this big giant check. And this person who's giving the money, donating the money to the church, they'll be up there on the platform and the pastor will be up there. And the pastor will say, we praise the Lord for our brother so-and-so. And look, this is how much he's giving towards our need, uh, our special fund or whatever they're having. Well, you know something? That guy that's up there and his chest is, you know, uh, he's holding his chest out, you know, and he's, he's there. And he says, I'm the one giving this. Everybody see how much I'm giving? What is the Bible saying? He has his reward. Right then and there, he's getting any reward that he's getting, there it is, and it's gone that quick. And maybe he's a hero today, and maybe he'll be zero tomorrow, amen? But the thing is, it's, he, he's doing it for the wrong motive, and really that's what the Lord is saying here. You shouldn't give in order to be seen of others. But as your pastor, now let me, let me, let me uh, go to meddling here maybe to some of you, but as your pastor, I don't want you to go to the other extreme. What do you mean, pastor? I have asked you as your pastor to do what? Where am I going with this? I've asked you as your pastor to put your name on your offering envelope. That's why we have offering envelopes. Put your name there with the amount, okay? And you say, well, you know, I'm ashamed. Why would you be ashamed of putting your name on the envelope? Well, Pastor, right here you're saying, you know, my motive is to please the Lord, but I am your pastor, and I'm asking you to put your name on the offering envelope. It's not for a bad reason. It's for a good reason. Okay, Pastor, tell me your reason. Why do you want to know what I'm giving? Number one, I want to know what you're giving because I want to see how God's blessing you. It's a pure motive. I'm your pastor. I have to watch over you, not have to, I get to watch over you, okay? It's been, it's been part of my responsibility as God has placed me here to lead the church. I want to see how the Lord is blessing you. I want to see how you're growing in the area of giving. That's a barometer. We can claim all day how much we love the Lord. We prove, the, we prove our love for the Lord and for others by our giving. And so I'm asking you, put your name on the Envelope. Another reason why I want you to tithe or I want you to give and I want you not to be ashamed of what you're giving. Listen, I'm not concerned about the amount. 
And I don't know if you're tithing or not. I do want to know if you're giving. I mean, you can give 5% instead of 10%. You're stealing from God. God knows it. I don't know it. I'm not looking for that reason. I'm looking to see if you are faithful in your giving. I, have, I am not the Lord. I don't have the ability to know if you're really giving a full 10% or not. But at least I can see if you are giving. I'm assuming you're tithing, okay? I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt. Why would you want to know that? Again, I told you I want to see how the Lord's blessing you. I want, to, I want to rejoice with you as the Lord is blessing you. But the second reason is, is when a hardship comes your way as your pastor, and a hardship comes your way, it's brought to me as your pastor, you know what I do? I go into our giving records. Why would I do that? Because I want to see, have you been faithful in giving to the Lord, or have you been faithful in robbing and stealing from the Lord? Because if I don't see your name in the giving list, the only thing I can assume is that you're not giving to the Lord. You're actually stealing. You're robbing from God over Malachi chapter 3. And so if that's the case, I guarantee you I'm being super transparent. If I see that you're giving, I'm going to be more inclined to say, church, we need to get behind this person. We need to help this member. Because they are faithful in their giving, they're faithful to the Lord, they have a problem, they have a need, and we need to step up and we need to help them. If I don't see your name there, it really makes me wonder, what does the Bible say? The Bible says you reap what you sow. And if you're stealing from the Lord, guess what? You're going to have financial problems. I guarantee you that's going to happen. How do you know that, Pastor? Because Malachi tells us it will happen. You steal, you rob from God, the Bible says he will curse you with the curse. The Bible says if you are, are, are faithful in giving your tithes and offerings, he'll open up the windows of heaven, shower you with the blessing that you cannot contain. I'm going to believe the word of God. And even though I don't have to see and know everything, I do know what the word of God says, and I do know if you're having a financial problem, it could be linked back to what you are just reaping what you have sown. So I would ask you uh, not to go to the extreme. Understand the, the, the word of God and the promises of God. Uh, it says, given it shall be given unto you. If you're faithful to God and you're giving, God's going to be faithful to bless you. Let me give you another verse, Hebrews 13, 17. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. So right here, the Bible is telling us that as the Lord has placed me here over you, that I am held in account. And I need to know, there's a problem in your life, there's sin in your life, whatever it may be, if I need to come and sit down and counsel with you, uh, I need to do that because I am responsible to give an account to the Lord for you as a member of Berean Bible Baptist Church. But it's also saying here that as your pastor, you are to submit to me. And I don't believe, you know, the Bible says we are not, as a pastor, I'm not to lord over you. And I don't believe I've ever lorded over, over the church or over individuals in our church. That would be the wrong thing to do. I think there are some pastors that do lord over their membership and do lord over uh, the members of the church. And so what I'm saying is I'm asking you to, to submit to the leadership, not because it's me, but because of the position. And I'm asking you, if you haven't been, start putting your name on the offering envelope, okay? I want to I wanna see the growth. I want to see how God's blessing you. And the Bible says here at the end of that verse, when you fail to obey, it is unprofitable for you. And so I want the best for your life. And I want to know what you're doing. And certainly, please understand the motive for this. It's not for a bad thing. It's for a good thing. And so please follow in that area. Having a pure heart. I pray, Lord, my heart is pure in this matter as well. How about praying? Not only giving, but in praying. Uh, verse 5 of Matthew 6. When thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be what? Seen of men. Verily I say unto you, once again, they have the reward. Why? Because of the motive. Why are they doing it? Whether they're giving alms, whether they're giving, they want everybody to know it. They want the trumpet to be blown. They want the notification, uh, the recognition. It's no different here in the hypocrites who are praying. 
they're not really praying to God. They're really uh, praying uh, that others might hear how eloquent their prayer is, at least in their own mind, okay? Sad to say, I really believe that in, in probably all the religions of the world, including Baptists, there's a lot of public praying that is worded more for the people than it is really worded for the one that they are supposed to be praying to. And I think that that's a very natural uh, motive or natural thought. We, we certainly want people to think of us in a high way and, and more highly than they ought to think. And so sometimes when we get up and we're asked to pray publicly, we're, we're nervous. Why should we be nervous? I mean, if we're praying to a God that loves us, why should we be nervous? You know why we're nervous? Because we're nervous how our prayer is going to come out. And if we're praying to the Lord, that should not be true. If we're praying to him and our prayer is, Lord, just, just want to ask you to bless our service, just want to pray that you'll use who's ever preaching or whatever the case may be, and Lord, I pray that you'll save souls if someone's lost here this morning. It's really, it shouldn't really be concerned or the prayer, the person who's praying, shouldn't be so concerned about who's listening to that prayer except God himself. If he's the one we're praying to, then we need to pray to him. And so we need to do that, and we need to do it in a right way, not as the hypocrites do. Again, the hypocrites wanted the attention. They wanted everyone to think more highly of them, to think how spiritual, how eloquent is their prayer, and certainly it was the wrong motive for sure. And so I would say to our men, please keep that in mind when you're call, called up for, for public prayer. Don't worry about who's here. You're praying to the Lord. He's here as well. Pray to him. Put everybody else out of your mind. Pray for the service. Don't get up here and see how long you can pray. Just ask the Lord to bless the service. Ask the Lord to, to use uh, the opportunity that we have to worship him, the opportunity we have to hear the word of God, and just make it to the point asking the Lord to make the service special for his honor and glory. Right along the same lines here, not only in our giving, not only in our prayer, uh, prayer life or praying, but also in fasting. Look at verse 16 of Matthew 6. Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites. You notice every time <clears throat> he's saying, don't be a hypocrite when you, when you give. Don't be a hypocrite when you pray. Don't be a hypocrite when you fast. Of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have what? Once again, they have their, their reward. And so uh, going around, you know, with the kawawa face like, oh, I haven't eaten in the last three hours. <laughs> oh, you really fasted that long? <laughs> three whole hours? <laughs> yeah, it's a little exaggeration, but that's the point. The point is, if, they've, if they're fasting... Uh, fasting for a day, if they're fasting for a week, or how long they're fasting. Uh, certainly we should, it's, it's a sin. It's a sin to go around and brag about it. And that is the flesh again. We talked about the difference between the flesh this morning and what the flesh wants us to do. And so, you know, going around, and, and that's exactly what the Lord is saying, putting on the sad countenance. Oh, I finally made it up the steps. I don't have any energy. I haven't eaten, you know, in, in three days or whatever it may be. And so the Lord says, no, don't do that. Wash your face. Look, look like you're ready to go. Keep it concealed. If you can't keep it concealed, well, then cut the fast and go have a meal and get your strength back. And don't be a stumbling block and don't be a hypocrite in, in what you're doing. Verses 17 and 18 said that. It says, wash your face. Be refreshed. Uh, if you can't do that, then don't fast or just fast long enough where nobody knows that you're fasting. And, and, and seriously, uh, uh, we, we have that, uh, we have that, again, bent. We have that, that's our nature. We can go back to praying. Have you ever heard when someone's praying and, and they get up there and pray and actually what they do is they start bragging on themselves when they're praying? I've heard that. People do. People brag on themselves and they're praying. Lord, thank you that this morning, even though our service started at 7, I thank you, Lord, that, that I was able to read 20 chapters in the Bible this morning. Like, what does that have to do with the service? Lord, thank you uh, 
today, dear Lord, or thank you this week, I was able to lead 27 people to the Lord. Thank you, Lord. What is that doing? It's bragging. That, that, you know, that is making, you never hear somebody pray, and dear Lord, thank you for forgiving me of my sin this morning that I committed, and then announce their sin. You never hear anybody making that prayer. You never hear anybody exposing, and Lord, thank you for forgiving me, I'm such a terrible person. You don't hear that. But you do hear in the prayers, Lord, thank you for all of the good things that I've done. And, and can I just mention a few for everybody will know how great I am? That's the flesh. And the Lord is saying that type of prayer is a prayer of a hypocrite. It's not to be so. We're not to brag on ourselves. We're not to use it as an opportunity. I can let everybody know how spiritual I am, how Christ-like I am. That is far removed from the Lord and from the Word of God. God, help us to, that, that, that in our giving, that in our praying, that in our fasting, we're doing it as unto the Lord, not to be known. If somebody finds out about it, well, fine, let them find out. I have nothing to hide, but I'm not going to stand up and brag about it because it's wrong. Because if I do that, there's my reward. Any reward in heaven, it's God. I've disqualified myself for it. I would wonder if, if you spent a night in prayer, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I've never spent a whole night in prayer, okay? There's, there's a true confession. Lord, forgive me. I've never spent a whole night in prayer. But if you spend a whole night in prayer, I imagine that anyone that spends a whole night in prayer probably will let someone else know, well, I can't come this morning because I spent all last night in prayer. And, you know, there's that tendency. There's the tendency of the flesh is to what? Is to build up the flesh, to let everybody else know how great you are and by so doing, you're actually doing the reverse. When a person starts bragging on themselves and letting everybody know how great they are, certainly they're going in the wrong direction. If the Lord knows it, and he does, well, then praise the Lord. That settles it right there. Lord, I'm doing it as unto you, not to be seen of men, not to be a hypocrite. So whether it's in our giving, whether it's in our praying, whether it's in our fasting, we need to examine, am I doing it for the right motive? Am I doing it because I love the Lord and I'm giving from a heart of love? So remember, God sees everything. Number two, I need to re review my motives. Number three, I need to realign my priorities. Realign my priorities. Exodus 20, verse 3. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Wow. This is the first commandment, and God is saying, I want, I deserve, I demand the first place. God deserves first place. Can you say amen? God deserves first place in our life, not second place, not third place, not somewhere down the totem pole, you know, eighth or ninth. No, God deserves and God demands first place in our life. Now, Christ might have the preeminence in all things. Okay. How do I know what my priorities are? How can we know what our priorities are? Well, first of all, look at your activities. What's your life like? What, what do you do during the week? Where do you invest your time? Where do you invest your money? Matthew 6, 19 and 20, and also in verse 21, listen to this. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon the earth where moth and rust are corrupt, where thieves can break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. For where your treasure is, there will what? There will your heart be also. So whether you say where you, where you invest, that's where your heart is. Or you can also say, I believe, where your heart is, is that's where you're going to invest. Either way. They're both going to be in the same place. Wherever my heart is, that's where I'm going to invest. Wherever I'm investing, that's where my heart is, okay? So either way you say that, it's synonymous. Your heart's going to be there where you are investing. So where you put your investment, that's where, really, that's what, why you're investing in that, because that's where your heart is. You can say, the Lord has first place in my life. He's number one. No one else comes close. There's no competition. Well, you know, let me look at your checkbook, okay? Let me look and see, see where you're making your investment. And that's going to pretty, pretty much have a, a good clue of where your heart really is. Is the Lord number one? 
Are, again, are, are you tithing? Are you being faithful in your tithes and in your offerings? Do you care about souls? Are you giving the faith promise? I mean, constantly, faithfully, your commitment that you've made. Have you kept that commitment? Well, you know, I started, but, you know, the Lord just didn't supply. I don't believe that. I believe if the Lord led you to give a commitment and promise a commitment, I guarantee you if you're doing it and you did it for the right motive in the right way, I believe God gave it to you. You just failed to give it. You didn't stay faithful to the commitment. Don't blame God. Don't be like, uh, don't be like Adam that blamed God. If it wasn't for this wife you gave me, I'd still be, you know, a perfect man. No, let's not go there because that's a lie. And so don't blame God that, well, Lord, you didn't give it. I guarantee you, if God gave you an amount to give and you failed to give it, don't blame God. Look in the mirror again, like we said this morning. Self is behind that. You are the one that stopped it, not God, for sure, okay? So we need to make sure uh, concerning my priorities. What are my priorities? Where is the Lord in my life? Where is the Lord in my activities? Where do I spend my most time? You know, how faithful am I? to the Lord. How faithful am I to the services? Now you're here tonight. We lost, you know, how many, how many did we lose that were here this morning that are not here tonight? And then Wednesday night there will be less and I realize Wednesday night we have traffic and all of those things. But I'm saying, where is the Lord? Where are you spending your time? Where are you spending your money? Where are you making your investment? So why does God want the first 10% to show us, to remind us that the 100% came from God. 100% came from Him. He's only asking for 10%. Wow. You know, praise the Lord. And so we need, to, we need to realize the Lordship of Him, of the Lord. We need to realize and recognize He deserves and demands number one place. We need to give Him that place. We need to examine, okay, what are my motives? Why am I, where am I investing? Not only that, we need to look at our anxieties, our anxieties, not only our activities, what we're doing with our week, with our time, but how about my anxieties? Well, how does that play into it? Well, verse 25 of Matthew 6, Therefore I, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, or what you shall drink, or yet for your body, no, yet for your body, what ye shall put on, is not the life more than meat and the body more than raiment? And so the Lord is saying here, we need to, uh, we need to go through all of Matthew 6. And if you, you study Matthew 6, you're going to find out that the common worries. What do people normally worry about? I believe it's on the overhead. Verse 24 talks about finances. People, people who usually have the most money have the most worries about their money because they want more of it. They never can get enough. So they worry about their finances. Verse 25, food, okay? And a lot of people worry about that too. Verse 27 is fitness, okay? Verse 28 is fashion, what we're going to wear. Verse 34, worrying about the future. The Lord says, don't worry about these things. If I am the Lord of your life, which I should be, but a lot of times we don't allow that. But if the Lord is the Lord of your life, then understand and realize he's going to meet these needs, all your needs. If you and I qualify. What do you mean by qualifying? Well, we'll see that in a moment, if we qualify. So if you're worrying about any of these things, it means that God is not first in your life. You have a misplaced priority. In other words, if you're worried about any of these areas, Obviously, you're not living the way you should be living because God's made promises and God doesn't lie when God makes a promise. And so if there's an area in your life that you're worried about, you're not living by faith. You're, you're worrying. And, and I know we're all guilty, okay? Right from your pastor, right on down the line, we are all guilty of worrying. And Lord, forgive us when we worry. What, whatsoever is not of faith, my Bible tells me it's what? It's sin. When you and I fail to believe that God's going to take care of us, if we have been faithful in giving, faithful in what we need to be faithful in, then we are sinning against God, and we're doubting that he can supply and take care of us when he's promised to do so. So we need to check out what, what our activities, 
Where do we spend most of our time? Are we faithful to the Lord? Are we faithful to the house of God? Are we faithful to visitation? Are we concerned about souls? Are we given to missions? So on and so forth. And what are our anxieties? What, what do we worry about? Why should we worry? Why should we worry? What do we sing? Why should we worry when we can pray? Bring it to the Lord. Allow the Lord to work in a miraculous way. Worry indicates there's a wrong priority. Check out these things to see if your motives are right. And then number three, we need to make sure and check our motives. Look at my ambitions. Ambitions, my goals for life. Direction of my heart. What do I want out of life? Where am I going? What do I want to succeed at? Who do I want to become? And we said this morning, we should all want to become like the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that may sound, sound pious, but that's the truth. We should all desire, Lord, help me to become like you more and more every day. That should be our goal. Why? Because that's God's goal for our life. He says that to be conformed to his image. Whatever is the number one goal in my life, ambition of my life, what's important to me, that becomes my God. Yeah, it becomes an idol. If it's not the right thing, it becomes an idol. Because now we're pursuing something other than pursuing being Christ-like. And any time and every time you and I choose something else as our goal, besides that, then it becomes an idol in our life. Why? Because now we take the Lord from being first place, and now we're putting him down, and we're taking our goals, our ambitions, and we're putting that actually before the Lord. Well, I'd like to be there, but I have a different, you know, I have a different commitment uh, this evening, or I have a different commitment Sunday, or I have to go do this, or I want to go do that. And what, what do we do? We kind of push the Lord aside. Well, he's still my Savior. Maybe he's not my Lord right now, but he's still my Savior. I'm still going to heaven. And we get our priorities all mixed up, our ambitions. I want to become great in this world. I want to become rich. I want to become whatever it may be. So the Lord says, don't worry and, uh, about what we're going to eat, drink, wear, uh, our Heavenly Father is going to take care of that. How do we know that? Pastor, how can you be so sure? Again, because he promised it right here. Verse 33 of Matthew 6, a very popular, very well-known verse. But seek ye first. You're worried about what you're going to wear. You're worried about food. You're worried about clothing. You're worried about whatever it may be. He says, okay, stop worrying, seek first the kingdom of God, his righteousness, and all these things that are very natural and normal to worry about, stop doing that. He'll take care of your needs. That's his promise. All these things shall be added unto you. But we get it backwards, and we do all the worrying. We don't put the Lord first, and we don't seek him first, and we pull him or push him or move him out of first place in our life, and we have the problems, duh, we disqualify ourselves. We disobey what he tells us. If it's a secret to the world, it shouldn't be a secret to us. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Having the pure heart, living the pure life, being like the Lord. He's promised to take care of us. The problem with a lot of Christians is that they have the same ambitions as unbelievers. A lot of Christians do. Sad to say same ambitions, want the same things. And as a result, what happens? They have the same stress. They have the same tension. They have the same headaches. They have the same problems of the world. Why? Because they're living of, of and by the world and by the standards of the world and living by the culture of the world instead of living above the world. Instead of saying, Lord, I want you first and, and, and whatever it causes in my life, I know it's going to be good for, for my good and for your glory. And so, Lord, help me to obey. Help me, Lord, to get in to the, if it's a secret to the world, help me to get in what I know to be true. Your promise, I'm claiming it. I'm going to live by faith. Happy are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Being pure in heart means, first of all, I continually, I'm continually conscious of the Lord's presence. That's important. We forget about that. We can all say, amen, the Lord's here this evening. Praise the Lord. But we need to be conscious of that, that the Lord is continually with us. You know, that, that could be a blessing or a curse. How can it be a curse if we're not living the life? If we push him out of first place, if we don't allow him to be first place, 
If we don't allow him and, and allow him to be Lord of our life, then it becomes a curse. Why? Because he's there ever seeing you and me living the life that we shouldn't be living, making the choices that we shouldn't be making, having the priorities, the ambitions that we shouldn't be having. How much that hurts the Lord, but how wrong is it on our part? And how much, not only are we hurting the Lord, but how much are we harming our own life? Now we're negating, or now we're stepping away from seek, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and now we're seeking our kingdom and our righteousness. There's no promise that our needs are going to be met, and sure enough, the anxieties are going to be here. The stress is going to be here. The tension's going to be here. The problems are going to be here. Yes, you're going to have tension problems over here also, but the Lord is there to meet them. There's the difference. Instead of being over here doing our own thing, I'm over here trusting the Lord. The problems are still going to come, but Lord, I'm trusting in you by faith. And guess what? He takes care of the problem. Over here, what happens? You're living in the flesh. The problems come, and they're probably not taken care of. And now what am I going to do? And thank the Lord. Natural reaction is come crawling back to the Lord. Lord, please forgive me. And the Lord is there. Just like Israel, the Lord is there. Thank the Lord. He is there. But how much heartache do we endure and how much heartache do we go through because of the simple word disobedience, simple word of lacking faith, simple word of living and allowing the flesh to rule instead of the Lord to rule. A mature believer focuses on pleasing God, pleasing God. He has a heart that is pure. True joy boils down to simply who do you want to please in life? The Lord, I believe, would say to, say to us this evening, you want to please other people? Fine, go ahead, try it out. Try and please other people. See how that goes for you. See how that's working. You cannot please all the people. My dad used to say, you can't fool all the people all the time. Well, you know, you can't please all the people all the time either. I guarantee you, if I stood up here and I tried to please every member, it would never, ever happen. I can't try to please you. I have to please the Lord, Amen. And if I'm pleasing the Lord, I have to take whatever slack that comes, whatever, uh, whatever response comes. But if I'm pleasing the Lord, I don't have to worry about it because he's the one that I need to please. It's a lot easier to please the Lord than trying to please everybody else. And when, the, and when people of this world, even believers, even Christians, go around and they start pleasing everybody else, it's a, it's a life of disappointment. It's a life of heartache. It's a life of, of, of failure, really, is what it turns out to be. Why? Because you could never, ever please everyone. If I said, I want to please everybody just in this one section, there's no way I'm going to do that. Because there's individuals in this one section that have certain preferences that are just the opposite of other individuals here. And if I try to please this group, then the other group is going to say, oh, how come you pleased them? And you didn't please us. Well, can't please everybody, but if I'm pleasing the Lord, then the Lord can work in your heart and say, well, pastor's doing what's right. He's following the Lord, and everybody is a winner. Amen? And so we need to do that as well as individuals. The Lord says, okay, you want to try to please people? See how that works? It's not going to work. Much easier, much, uh, it makes so much more sense. There's so much more wisdom when we say, Lord, I'm, my goal in life is to please you. And I know as I do that, I'm seeking first the kingdom of God. And I know all these other things, they're going to take care. You're going to take care of them. They'll be added unto me. Secondly, I'm content with the Lord's praise. I'm content with the Lord's praise. The Pharisees were looking for man's praise. They're hypocrites. They were looking for man's praise. So what do they do? Again, I think I may have said it this morning, we do things in our life to help or to make people think more highly of us than they ought to think, okay? And so that is being the hypocrite. Why? Because now I'm doing something. I'm putting on the hypocrite. They were known to put the mask, okay? That's what it meant, the original. To put a mask on. So you're, you're pretending to be somebody else. So... <clears throat> Uh, when we have different presentations up here. I think, uh, uh, Jude, were you, were you Jonah the one time in the belly of the fish? And, and so we had the big whale up here. And so, so Jude gets inside or behind the big whale. How many of you remember that? And he gets, so what is he doing? He's putting a mask on. He's pretending he's someone he's really not. And he's up here. Remember, he was running, run, Jonah, run. Playing the act. 
And that's, that's what so many people do. That's sad to say what we do in our life sometimes, pretending we're something we're really not. And we are the losers. Because now we're not really that. And we, in, inside, we know that we're only pretending. And so how can we be happy if we're playing, playing a hypocrite? When we, know, when we know that deep inside, that's not really us. But if I'm pleasing the Lord, and that's my goal in life, to pre- please the Lord... You know, one day I will hear, well done, thy good and faithful servant. And I might not have the applause of men, and I might, and certainly I'm, I cannot, no one can please all the people all the time, so why even go there and try? But thank the Lord, if I'm pleasing him, and he has first place in my life, just let everything fall like it's going to fall, and I know I have his blessing, I know I have his praise, and that should be enough for me, to know that I'm pleasing the one that created me. I know that I'm serving and that I'm allowing him to have first place in my life. Let's go over to Mark 12. Mark 12. I don't, this is not on the overhead. It is in your Bible. Mark 12. Look at verse 41 and following. And Jesus sat over against the treasury... And behold, and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury, and many that were rich cast in much. Now, you know, I'm just thinking right now that, you know, in our service, at the end of our service, what are we going to do tonight at the end of our service? We're going to take an offering, isn't that right? And the ushers are going to come up, we're going to pray, we're going to take the offering, and we're going to put into the offering plate. You know, the Bible tells us here in Mark uh, 12, that Jesus is watching what's being placed in the offering. You know that Jesus is here every time we take an offering? You see, again, I said that the presence of the Lord can be a blessing or a curse. To those that are robbing the Lord, it can be what? It can be a curse, and it is a curse if they're stealing from him. And so the Lord is watching what we give. Verse 42, And there came a, a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites, which make a farthing. And so uh, one farthing here is worth anywhere from one to four cents, okay? And so not a lot of money for sure. But again, it is the Lord who's making the comment. It is the Lord who's observing what's being given. So the Lord's sitting there. The Lord sees the rich coming up putting large amounts in, probably blowing the trumpet. Okay, everybody know, everybody see what I'm giving? Verse 43, and he called unto him his disciples. He wants them to learn something about giving here. And saith unto them, verily I say unto you, that this poor widow had cast more in than all they which have cast into the treasury. But Lord, I don't understand. I mean, we read here, the rich cast in much. And then we read the poor widow, she cast in two mites. But then the Lord says, the widow has cast in more than all they which cast into the treasury. So here they have all this money and all the amount that they've cast in. And he says, I want you to notice something. The widow, she just gave this small, uh, insignificant amount compared to the great amounts that were given by these others. And yet the Lord says she's given more than they all did. <clears throat> Verse 44. For all they did cast in of their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. So many blessings out of that. So many blessings. You know, we have, we have different ec- economic status here at Berean. Here's the thing, if you're doing it for the right reason, the right motive, and you're not blowing the trumpet, and you're not wanting to be seen of men, you're not wanting to have the praise of men, you're wanting to please the Lord and, and are satisfied with well done, thy good and faithful servant, you're doing it as unto the Lord, that beats all the praise of men. That lasts for a couple seconds and it's gone. To hear well done, thy good and faithful servant. To know that what you're doing, you're doing from the heart. You're doing from a pure heart. You don't, 
You don't care if anybody knows. You don't care if they find out. I mean, there's nothing to be ashamed of. The amount is not what's important to the Lord. God's looking at the heart. God's looking at the sacrifice. And what I mean by that, yes, it should be 10%, okay? So what I'm saying is about the amount. You might, your 10% may be 150th percent of what someone else is giving as far as you compare the amounts. But you're still giving, you're still giving the, the right amount. What I'm saying is, is God's looking at your heart and God's not looking, I believe, at so much as how much you're giving, but how much is left over. And what does he say about the widow? He's saying she gave it all. She gave everything she had. They gave out a portion of what they had. They had a lot, of, a lot left over. She didn't have anything left over. She's giving by faith. She's giving out of a heart of love, out of a pure heart. And the Lord says unto them, I want you to know, she gave, she cast in more than all the others cast in together. How much do you love the Lord? I believe that widow loved the Lord. She had recognition of the Lord. She had praise of the Lord. The number three, <clears throat> I'm controlled by God's priorities. He or she has his heart set on what the Lord says is important. God's priorities. It's not really important what, is, what are my priorities. If my priorities are not the Lord's priorities, my priorities are wrong. Can you say amen? You understand that? If my priorities are not in line with God's priorities, then my priorities are wrong. It's just like if my goals in life, if my ambition is li in life <clears throat> is contrary to God's will for my life, well, then my ambition and my goals in life are, are wrong. And so we need to understand that. We need to realize that. I need to be controlled by God's priorities. I need to be controlled by God's will for my life. We could have stayed, we could have stayed in the United States and could have went and planted a church there and, 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 you know, tried to serve the Lord there, but that would have been out of God's will for my life and, and our life. And, and even though souls could have got saved there, still I would have been out of God's perfect will for our life. And that's what we need, to, we need to understand and realize that if I'm going to be and reach the potential that God has for me, not my potential that I have for myself, but for what God has for me, his plan for my life, his will for my life, his priorities for my life. If I'm going to do that, I have to be right in the center of his will. And if I'm in the center of his will, well, then the results, again, are left up to him. And I just need to thank him for whatever the results are. You know, <clears throat> the Bible says we're not to compare ourselves with ourselves. And a lot of times I think we get in that mindset where we start comparing ourselves. Uh, Missionaries comparing ministries and so on and so forth. There's pastors comparing ministries. And uh, it, it, it's not right to do. The Bible says compare, we're not to compare ourselves with ourselves. Compare ourselves with the Lord. Thank God for one soul that gets saved. And thank Lord for the increase that he gives. But being content. Godliness with contentment is great gain. And so having the, the right priorities, realizing I'm serving the Lord... Whatever happens, if I'm seeking him and his will is first in my life, his place is first in my life, whatever the results are, praise the Lord. I'm going to thank him for it because it's far more than I deserve, okay? So if I determine to be honest, transparent person of integrity with unmixed motives, what will the results be? What will the results be of having a pure heart? Well, number one, you'll have joy. You'll have joy. Something you cannot buy, okay? Uh, you can buy happiness, I guess. You know, if you have enough money, let's go to, you know, let's go to the park and have a great time. We can be happy for a little while. But you can't really have what God gives is joy. And that goes beyond. We said joy, uh, happiness is really, uh, how are the circumstances? If the circumstances are good, then I can be happy. If the circumstances are bad, then I'm going to be sad. But if I'm in the center of God's will, like Paul was many times, even if the circumstances are terrible, still I can have joy because I'm right where God wants me to be. That's the difference. The world can offer happiness. God offers true joy. So Bible says, happy are the pure in heart, or joy-filled are the pure in heart. 
Why? Well, because you're not faking it. You're not trying to be a phony. You're not trying to pretend that you're something you're not. You're genuine. You're real. You're authentic. Okay? There's no facade. There's no mask. What you see is what you get. But the opposite is true. Unhappy uh, people are people of divided hearts, people of hidden agendas, trying to please everyone. Joy is when you don't have any fear of being found out. Why? Because you're pure in heart. There's no ulterior motives. Not only that, but the Bible says you will see God. For they shall see God. This is the result of having a pure heart, living for the Lord no matter what. You get to see the Lord working in your life. It doesn't mean we get to see God and you go home at night and, and the Lord's sitting there on your bed and you say, oh, Lord, I'm glad you're here. Pastor told me if I had a pure heart, I'd see you, and I'm glad you're here. I get to see you tonight. No, it's not that, okay? You're not going to see the Lord. If you have a vision, maybe you ate something that didn't settle, and you got, you know, you didn't sleep well, and you had a vision. That is, we don't have visions today. You're not going to see the Lord in true life, but we do. And those of you that are, are living for the Lord, you have seen the Lord work in your life, okay? You have seen the Lord, His presence in your life. And really, that's what I believe it's talking about. And certainly, we will see the Lord one day. He's going to come back to us. We're going to see Him. We're going to be like Him. Amen? We have all those promises. And so it's never wrong. It's never, ever wrong to live the life that God wants us to live. It's always the right thing to do. And there's always rewards for doing what's right, for obeying. Always rewards. And reward, rewards that this world could never give. So you'll see the Lord working in your life in circumstances. Uh, certainly we'll see him in heaven. Uh, just as you don't see too well with the dirty glass. You, you know, if you have dirty glasses, those of you that wear glasses, our glasses get dirty. Isn't that right? Sometimes I'll be looking out of my glass and even sometimes mom will say, honey, clean your glasses. How can you even see out of your glasses? I'll, and I'll look at them. I'll say, wow, yeah, they are dirty. And maybe that's why I can't read good. My, my glasses are too dirty. You can't see too good out of dirty glasses. You can't see the Lord too good from a dirty heart. Amen? So our heart needs to be pure. Our heart needs to be clean. And then we have better vision, better spiritual vision. You will see God. So if you're, you're a believer, certainly we need to praise the Lord for the potential. We have such great potential. The abundant life. We talked about that this morning a little bit. Living the life that's abundant. Living the life that's a life of joy. Even when the, the terrible circumstances come our way, the bottom falls out still. I'm right where the Lord wants me to be. It's okay if there's no bottom here, if the, the things don't seem to be adding up. By faith, I believe God's going to meet my need. By faith, He's going he's to show Himself. He's going to manifest His presence miraculously. He's done it in the past. He's done it Yesterday or just this, this week, I know he's going to do it in the future. That's what Paul was saying constantly. He's delivered me. He's delivered me in the past. He's delivered me in the present. And I'm looking forward to him to deliver me in the future. Why? Because that's my God. He loves me. He cares about me. And as I live for him, I can be certain, 100% sure, he's going to supply all my needs according to his riches in glory. So where are you tonight? Do you have a pure heart? Do you have a transformed heart? Do you have a new heart that he's given? Well, if you don't, you can certainly get one, and you can get it from the Lord. You can't get it from me. I can't give you a new heart. Uh, even a, a doctor that, that gives heart transplants, that's not going to give you the new nature and what you need for the Lord, to live for the Lord, but the Lord can. He's in the, uh, he's in the business. <clears throat> he's, never, he's never lost a patient yet, amen? And he'll give you a new heart if you'll come to him, repent of your sin, and ask for forgiveness. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you for each one that is here tonight, faithful to you, striving, Lord, to live for you, trust in you, allowing you to be Lord of their life. And Lord, I do pray for all of us this evening, dear Lord. I know that every single one of us are guilty of, of uh, allowing other things to, uh, to crawl up or creep up or, or fight their way up for, for first place in our life. And Lord, I, I'm afraid that sometimes we allow that to happen. And Lord, I pray you would forgive us for that. I pray, dear God, you would help us to, to never allow anything to, to nudge its way or to force it to fight its way up, Lord, to the place that only you deserve in our life. 
Help us, dear Lord, to have a pure heart. Help us, Lord, not to have a hidden agenda. Help us, dear God, not to be like the Pharisees, the hypocrites that are one thing on the outside and completely something else on the inside. Help our hearts to be clean. Help our hearts to be pure. Help our lives to be pure because you see every single thing. You know our thoughts. You know our motives. You know our words even before we speak them. I pray you would have your will and your way in each heart and life tonight that you might receive the honor and glory through our life. We'll be careful to thank you for it, for we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. We